today's World Insight. Trump has just six weeks left in the White House. Will he sabotage China-U.S. ties before Biden takes off? And then get this economy moving again. And as the devastating COVID-19 crisis surges again worldwide, how do artists share their craft? One of the world's greatest ballerinas tells all. So for us, it's just like a shock. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei. The Trump administration is getting tougher on China in a traditionally lame duck time of transition to the next president. Over the past few weeks, the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced the new visa restrictions on Chinese officials. He also said the U.S. had decided to end five China-U.S. cultural exchange projects. And according to top U.S. security officials last week, more than a thousand Chinese researchers have left the United States amid, quote, a crackdown on alleged technology theft. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi said on Monday, Beijing wants to build a healthy and stable relationship with the U.S. He admits, though, ties have faced the serious challenges in recent years. But the key word, according to him, is reconstruction. So will the incoming U.S. administration take a more measured, constructive approach to China? Let's talk to our panelists, who are really the people in the know. For China-U.S. ties, we are joined in Washington, D.C., Michael O'Hannon, Director of the Research for Foreign Policy at the Brookings Institution, and in New York, Daniel Russell, Vice President of the International Security and Diplomacy at the Asia Society Policy Institute. Last but not least, in Beijing, Huang Jing, Dean of the Institute of International and Regional Studies with Beijing Language and Culture University. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for joining us. There's one question that's on our mind. From now until January the 20th, are we going to see something unpleasantly unexpected to happen. That's a, a concern and worry in many of our minds. Mr. Russell, shall we be worried? There's a real possibility that you'll see more uh, actions by the departing Trump administration that uh, make uh, many Chinese unhappy. There's six weeks left before Trump leaves office. And since the election, we've already seen a series of uh, actions by the administration that affect uh, China. And there may be people in the Trump camp that want to sabotage U.S.-China relations or sabotage the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. And some of the people think that these are just absolutely the right things to do. The real question, Chen Wei, I think, is how will China react? That's what's going to matter. Um, because it's going to affect the environment uh, that will uh, greet uh, Joe Biden when he takes office on January 20th. Mm. It really depends, isn't it, uh, Mr. Huang, about what should China react and uh, to what extent that China will react to the degree of the events. Uh, now, Professor Huang, tell me more about how you would respond to Mr. Russell. I think that anyone with a rational mind and uh, understanding of American politics will remain calm and not to be taken by whoever tried to provoke, it, provoke some provocative in the bilateral relationship. But, but the problem is that, like the United States, China is not really united. There are different opinions and uh, different uh, stance uh, in terms of U.S.-China relations. So the Chinese leaders, uh, despite all the rationality and the understanding of American politics, they will have to respond to some opinions at, from, from home. On the other hand, Mr. O'Hanlon, if we assume that the nature of China-U.S. relations have been a bipartisan consensus, then whatever uh, Mr. Trump is doing right now and his administration just before January the 20th would pave for a foundation of what a president like Biden, when he comes into office after January the 20th, in other words, uh, the worse Trump did from now until January the 20th, the more quote-unquote bargaining power President-elect 
Biden might have some argue once he comes into the office when it comes to China-U.S. relations. So it seems to be an interesting um, tangle in a way. First of all, I don't think that President Trump's going to try to do President-elect Biden any favors to strengthen his bargaining position. So I would uh, not worry too much about that possibility. But Maybe not on purpose, that, but in reality. Well, it's but you're right. But in broader perspective, and Danny Russell knows this history, and and Wang Jing know this history uh, even better than I do. In broad perspective, we have not always had a bipartisan consensus in the United States on China policy. I think we've had it for a long time, probably for 40 years, from Kissinger and Nixon all the way through maybe latter Bush, early Obama. But for the last five to ten years, it's been dissolving. And now we are searching for a new consensus. And frankly, if one party could figure out a way to use the China issue against the other, I'm not sure that's out of the question. So I don't want to be too reassuring on that point. And certainly Donald Trump would be happy at this point when he's feeling very upset about his electoral defeat to look for any issues that could vindicate his presidency or perhaps even prepare him for a re-election effort in 2024, a rematch, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, should Joe Biden choose to run that. But let me say one thing of reassurance, which is that when I look around the world at the places where I think Donald Trump might use military force in the next seven weeks on his way out the door. I do not think of China and I do not think of Korea. I think primarily of Iran. I think that is the most plausible place where we could see a dramatic American action. I don't see that kind of possibility being nearly as plausible in East Asia. And so if military force is the ultimate thing to worry about, because, you know, issues with trade and diplomacy can be repaired. Mm -hmm. Military actions cannot always be undone. Got your point. Professor Huang, though, uh, to the pet experts of China-U.S. relations, there are quite a number of vulnerable issues that could be manipulated from now until January the 20th. I'm not talking about later. Later is another topic. But just during this period of time, uh, Professor Huang, for example, the issue of Taiwan, the sovereignty issue, South China Sea, and several others that could uh, lead to certain kinds of confrontation, even militarily, uh, even by proxy. So, Professor Huang, how concerned are you? Actually, I'm not really concerned uh, uh, in terms of Taiwan or South China Sea. First and foremost, uh, despite all those uh, chaotic situations uh, on both sides, uh, there are uh, working groups on um, a crisis management mechanism, thanks to uh, the former Secretary Esper and the Ch his China counterpart. I think at least the three such dialogues are going on, which are very effective. First. And second, especially on Taiwan, Issue. Both sides know where the red line is. We we'll try to uh, manage. And uh, last but not the least, even though uh, President Donald Trump wants to do something, I think the establishment and the so called deep state know how to uh, uh, act on Taiwan issue. Uh, the, the, the same South China Sea a little bit worrisome because both sides uh, are not very clear. Neither side are clear the other side's red line, and uh, the South China Sea will be a little bit more complicated. But having said that, I do not uh, see any, you know, possibility of uh, some conflict uh, in, okay. in both areas. I think uh, there will be tensions, of course, uh, but uh, uh, some, you know, actions taken, I, I do not see that kind of possibility is very large. Mr. Russell. Well, I agree with uh, Michael that the Asia-Pacific theater isn't the place where uh, the, where Donald Trump is uh, most likely to take reckless uh, military action. Uh, I'm a little less sanguine, perhaps, than Huang Jing uh, mm -hmm. about the uh, crisis prevention uh, mechanisms uh, which have atrophied over the last four years when it comes to our military-to-military -military relations. But both countries have you know, immensely professional militaries and they will continue to take steps to uh, ensure that uh, an incident doesn't escalate. But you know, problems don't happen always on purpose. They are often the unintended consequence That's of right. uh, just a, um, a collision or, or an accident. 
uh, that escalates and the political environment around them uh, can often make it difficult for uh, leaders to prevent it from growing into a full-blown confrontation. But uh, what I would say is let's not focus just on the defensive side. Mm. There's an important party to this question, which is China. And I think that the critical question is, what can China do now over the next six weeks and in the early stages of the Biden administration to help stabilize the relationship? Uh, I know all of you want to talk about the positive side, but as an expert of the issue. But I have to mention once again, before January the 20th, there are already several other steps the Trump administration has taken, whether significant or not. For example, the announcement against the Chinese Communist Party members and their relatives are traveling to the United States. As you may know, that number is huge here in China. What would that mean for the, uh, you know, people-to-people -people relations between the two countries? There are others uh, about the so-called uh, intel. Uh, technological theft accusations against uh, uh, Chinese Americans and Chinese uh, nationals that are working and studying in the United States. Uh, it is not just the Trump administration, but also uh, some of the uh, officials and also key figures likely to relate it with the uh, incoming administration that are making these accusations. So how further poisoned the atmosphere will have to be for the uh, president-elect to come into the office. We are at a tougher moment in U.S.-China relations, and we're going to have to accept that that will continue even into a Biden administration. And it's an important moment for leadership, for President-elect Biden. He's going to have to find a way to talk to the American people about how we can manage a more complicated relationship with China than we've had in almost 50 years. The good news, in my opinion, is that it's still a much better relationship than we had with China before the Nixon-Kissinger opening. Yeah. It's not fundamentally a relationship of two enemies. Some people may disagree, but I do not think of us as enemies. Last week, I interviewed General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he did not describe China as an enemy mm. or even as a likely future adversary. He said, yes, we will compete and we will compete in many areas, we will cooperate in some. The job of the military is to prevent that competition from becoming hostile or conflictual mm. or violent. And I agree with General Milley. I think we're at a moment where the relationship is just going to be tougher mm. on issues like the one you just mentioned, on intellectual property, on protecting uh, high technology, on issues in the South China Sea, uh, hopefully not on Taiwan, and we'll see what happens there. But I expect that the relationship is going to enter into a new phase. We don't really even have the right terms, the right frame of reference, the right concept to describe what the U.S.-China relationship is becoming. It's going to be different than it's been ever before. But I still am hopeful yeah. that we can find a way forward that will allow for competition to occur in some realms, cooperation in others, and prevent conflict above all else. Mr. Russell, once again, you've been working in the field for such a long time. You have many friends and colleagues and people you know well in the policy and the academic circle here in China. So, Mr. Russell, there has been always a debate about how to term it, you know, uh, whether it's competitor or rival, this is going to, or adversary, this is going to make a huge difference in terms of the approaches and policies. And secondly, since you earlier asked about what China is going to do, uh, Chinese ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Choi Tian Kai, earlier in the talk has been talking about China is willing to work on reopening of the U.S. Uh, um, uh, uh, embassy subsidiaries in China if conditions are ripe. So there seems to be already some indication what China wants to do. But we are not hearing much as to what the new administration after January 20th wants to do in terms of constructive uh, uh, building, or, 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 or at least in that direction, Mr. Russell. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I've traveled to China with uh, uh, President-elect Biden when he was vice president, yes. and uh, traveled with him when he hosted then Vice President Xi Jinping in Los Angeles, in Washington, D.C. Um, and I've seen him at, uh, engage. I know that he very much respects the, uh, China as a nation, China, uh, the people of China. 
Uh, he also believes in diplomacy and listening to the other side, respecting mm. the views and the interests of the other side. So, um, you know, I'm not pessimistic about uh, the prospects for uh, serious engagement, serious dialogue. But at the same time, Joe Biden's a passionate believer in, in respecting uh, rules and norms, mm -hmm. universal values, rights, freedoms. He's somebody who has immense uh, confidence in America and in the ability of democratic societies to innovate and to grow. He's a realist. He's a pragmatist. So I think what's important is uh, for the Chinese side to focus on what is it that we're trying to do? Mm. Unquestionably, there are uh, elements of fierce competition in the bilateral relationship between the United States and China. But are we competing in the way that uh, sports teams compete? Or are we competing in the way that criminal gangs compete? Is it constructive and bringing out the best in both sides? Or is it the kind of rivalry that brings out the worst in both of us? Mm. To me, this is a chance for uh, the Chinese side uh, to build on Ambassador Tsui Tian Kai's point, uh, not just to untie some of the knots that have uh, been tied in the last four years, mm -hmm. not just to fix some of the problems and the setbacks, um, but to really set some targets of what kind of relationship do we want to have? I'm going to come back to you, Mr. Russell, on some of the questions you beautifully raised earlier about what kind of nature of relationship does the U.S. want to have with China? For example, is it about sports teams or is it about, again, a uh, relationship? Uh, uh, I'll come back to you about that. But for now, let me come back to Professor Huang on that question <laughs> posed by Mr. Russell. Uh, Mr. Huang, from people you've been talking to, and the debates you have uh, with many, how do you see the question's answer should be? Uh, I think that, of course, both sides expect the other side to make the first move to show a kind <laughs> of willingness and, uh, and yeah, a desire exactly. to, to improve. And relations. what counts as first move I, I is think, also interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's, <laughs> uh, that's a very positive thing. That is, at least no one with the other side goes to the other ground. But China is facing reality, just we say that. The the the, the, dump, uh, the the Trump administration is keep doing some things that really really uh, set up the hurdles in the bilateral relationship. But if uh, you talk about China's initiative, uh, if we read the the, the statement uh, of the fifth plenum, which just been held last month, mm -hmm. uh, carefully you can see China actually has uh, uh, sent out some very positive signals uh, to the to the other side. For example, China said uh, the the Chinese government is trying to promote peaceful development in the cross-street relations and uh, the, the unification of motherland. The first uh, comes first a peaceful uh, development. Uh, to, my, to me, uh, if I read it, I would say that China will not take any provocative actions uh, on the Taiwan issue. And China also said that it will further you know, open the door, further the, op the policy of openness and reform, deepen reforms and uh, will not close, but will uh, be further open to the outside world, especially the United States. That's also a positive sign. And China said we try to, you know, let the market force to determine the distribution of resources uh, in the economic development, and will, you know, encourage entrepreneurship. Uh, that's also written in the so-called parties document, in the first plenum. I think that's all positive signs. Mm -hmm. But now I think right now the, the, the situation is this. Uh, both sides have to try to stop this free fall of the bilateral relationship. And for the Chinese leadership, I think it's important that uh, the Biden administration may not be able to do too much uh, in the bilateral relationship, uh, given the very uh, tough challenges the Biden administration is going to meet uh, at home, uh, on the one hand, and also on the kind of environment of so-called uh, China-U.S. strategic competition, which has been a norm, uh, you like it or not. And the last but not the least, of course, I think the first priority, the topmost priority of Biden administration is to make sure that the Democrats will not uh, lose or Democrats will prevail in the 2022 uh, midterm election because uh, if Democrats do not, 
uh, does not do very well in that. Uh, that means I mm. will be very much likely to face a very strong formidable challenge in 2024. Mm. So all of that says that uh, if China do not provoke, uh, be a little patient, and uh, like like uh, Danny mm -hmm. Russell said, show some uh, really good uh, gestures and gave Biden administration enough time be patient. Uh, then I, I hope the situation will be improved. Mr. Russell, unfortunately, after Professor Huang's uh, answer, you have more questions to answer. <laughs> First of all, whether the Biden administration, particularly President like Biden's hands, are being tied in terms of whatever his uh, strategic goal might be toward China, particularly changing the status quo right now or at least the, first, the current atmosphere. Secondly, what kind of nature of the relation China-U.S. Uh, do you think the incoming administration will have in mind? Would they be able to work toward that direction? And thirdly, what would count, do you think, to the Chinese eyes about uh, actions uh, and steps taken by the Biden administration after January the 20th as constructive? I certainly uh, understand that uh, as Huang Jing indicated, uh, Joe Biden's first order of business is to get America's house back in order. Uh, there are a lot of domestic priorities and issues that he needs to deal with. And I suspect that he may think that it's important to get some of these uh, domestic challenges under control before he can really begin to productively engage in foreign policy or engage uh, with with China. And I think secondly, in terms of uh, international affairs, uh, that he's made clear that he very much wants to uh, rebuild strained relations with America's closest friends and partners and allies uh, to unify countries around a uh, common uh, commitment to uh, universal values and rights and, and freedom. So that's likely to be uh, where he he starts. I mean, I know, as I said, from my experience with him, mm -hmm. that he uh, respects China and that he is a, a true believer in uh, in diplomacy and negotiation, in constructive compromise. But he's also a pretty formidable competitor who really believes that uh, in a in a fair playing field in a fair match that. Uh, the United States is pretty close to unbeatable. So mm. the kind of competition I suspect uh, that he wants is a competition that is bounded by some rules so that we're uh, each trying to be better, uh, better than we were, better than the other, uh, as opposed to trying to block or undercut uh, the other side. So that's also I think, a uh, hopeful uh, indicator. So I think um, probably from the Chinese perspective, uh, one of the early measures uh, that the Biden administration would be likely to take would be to reestablish uh, some degree of strategic uh, communication. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that dialogue is like penicillin or like the vaccine for uh, coronavirus. It's, <laughs> it's not going to solve uh, the problems, but it's an important tool. Mm. Uh, it's been neglected. Uh, we've, the U.S. has relied almost exclusively on Twitter for the last four years, and that simply doesn't work. The last point is to your question. Uh, undoubtedly, there are significant political pressures that the Biden administration faces. There may well be a Republican uh, led Senate. There's certainly going to be uh, Donald Trump sort of government in exile, criticizing him for any positive steps that he might take towards uh, China. That's a reality, but Joe Biden has spent the last four plus decades in politics. And secondly, uh, he fought hard to win the presidency. He knows what's important. He's a man of principle. He's got a lot of courage. I think he is um, pretty well suited to be able to uh, navigate uh, the political traps and the political winds okay. uh, and 
accomplish what he thinks is necessary and important in the relationship with China. I want to thank the three of you for joining us and providing your insights on this very critical issue as things develop. Thank you so much, uh, Michael Hannon, Daniel Russell, Huang Jing. Really appreciate gentlemen. Thank you. Be safe wherever you are. And you're watching World Inside with me, Tianwei. Still to come in the program. As the devastating COVID-19 crisis surges against worldwide, how do artists share their craft? Words of experience from one of the world's greatest ballerinas after a few minutes. You know, the music have no boundary, the dance have no boundary, you know, the theater, the opera, ballet have no boundary. We all are united. Welcome back. This is World Inside with me, Tian Wei. How are artists coping with the COVID-19 pandemic? I asked Yuan Yuan Tan, a principal dancer at San Francisco Ballet. As one of the world's greatest ballerinas, 2020 marks her 25th season with the ballet company. No principal dancer in the history of that company has ever lasted as long. Recently, Yuan Yuan has just finished her competition in a popular Chinese talent show, The Dance Smash. Her performance has left the judges and audiences in awe. Earlier in May, I had the chance to talk to Yuan Yuan while she was still in San Francisco. She shared with me what it takes to make it as a ballerina and how the pandemic affected the performances. But she is holding on. Take a look. Tell me more about that, how you and your colleague are trying to hold on at the time of pandemic. Yes, um, actually, when we uh, received the order from the city, that was March the 6th. That was the opening night of uh, Balanchine version of Midsummer Night Dreams. Mm. So that was the, the ballet we have not done for past like 30 years. That was the first time we we revisit this ballet. So we try really hard to put this fully ballet on stage and the opening night is March the 6th and I'm the opening of the Tatiana of this ballet. And after the show, we all get in, like uh, called back to the stage. We all gather together and the artistic director have to announce that uh, the rest of the show we have to cancel because of the order from the city. They closed down the War Memorial Opera House. At that day, we have 3,261 audience there. So for us, it's just like a shock. I would never ever thought in my life that would happen, like to be just saying, okay, the, sh the, the theater had to close down and you or the rest of the performance are like canceled. And I was really, really in shock. And uh, it was the first time in my life to feel like this weirdness in my body. We just do whatever we used to do, be in the room together, uh, to practice it together, doing the part to do so close to each other. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't think too much until then they say, oh, this is serious. And then we cannot be performing mm. that ballet or the rest of 30 ballets anymore um, but before that we just like regular schedule go into the studio go rehearse in the studio and then uh, go on stage to have stage rehearsal usually we are working from 10 o'clock until 10 o'clock at night because wow. sometimes the stage runs from 7 to 10 mm. o'clock for a ballerina this is extremely difficult you could only practice at home what is it like Right now, we have Zoom classes around the world. Mm -hmm. and you can pick and choose which group you want to join in. And it's open door for all the dances. Mm -hmm. And one day, I, was, I went in the Zoom uh, class. Where we have like about 210 people in wow. the same class. Mm -hmm. So that was amazing to see some friends I have not seen for a long time. <laughs> and they will show up there mm -hmm. and then take in the same classes. Yeah. So that was interesting, and uh, uh, we all, all the dancers cheer to each other. We're cheering, mm. like, wait, let, guys, ladies and gentlemen, let's do this together. 
-hmm. And tomorrow we'll, you know, do this hard exercises and we will be strong. And tomorrow we'll do the same thing until we're going to go back on stage. So we are motivated with the, the love, our uh, love for the art. I think that's the biggest motivation and dedication. And the peer support also. Yes, yes, yes. I, I was reading the moments of your uh, WeChat, which is Chinese Twitter, and uh, you were obviously went in, going into some very hilarious classes, <laughs> and you were laughing your way throughout that well, class. Oh. Yeah, well, I, because of, through all my career, I never cross-trained. Mm. For example, I never really did any yoga or gyrotonic or Pilates. But this time, you know, I, I have to just maybe that's the time for me to explore besides ballet. Yeah. And after the exercises for daily class, uh, since there's no rehearsals, no partners around to practice, uh, then I find maybe for some kind of cardio exercises <laughs> will help for mm -hmm. my you know, uh, lungs and uh, for my mind. So I find this class and now it's just, uh, you know, my first workout. So I made this like a uh, videos and just like <laughs> fast forward moment, yeah. kind of like it cracks me up. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Every time I watch it, it was yeah. so funny. Yeah. You were trying to, you know, try to cross training yeah. as you say, but it was, uh, there were a lot of hilarious classes going on all at the same time. Certainly for our viewers also to check some of those uh, from your advice. Uh, having said that, though, this is the 25th anniversary of your ballet career. I mean, this is serious, girl. I mean, you've been going on and on and on as a ballet dancer. It's impossible for the others, but you did it. How could it happen in this way? I mean, such a long life, a professional life of, as a ballerina, Yuan Yuan. Well, I think first of all, I'm very grateful that uh, you know uh, everything happened around me. And but I think for my uh, just like a very strong will, just uh, keep going because the love that I have for ballet and ballet is my life and it's my my religion. And uh, just uh, as long as I can continue, why not? And I'm grateful and I'm very blessed to have this like uh, physics are uh, suitable for ballet and I uh, have a strong mind and uh, to continue with this art craft. You know, basically to become, be a professional ballet dancer, you don't have life because you have to do a lot of things around the ballet. Like if there's one free day, you will sleep in a little bit, and then you do the PT, chiropractor, acupuncture, and uh, you know anything that just uh, you know soothes up your pain. Because mm. we have a lot of injuries and pain, um, but you know the next day you will go back to training again. Yuan Yuan Tan entered the Shanghai Dance School at the age of 11. Initially, her father was against this, as he wanted her to become a medical doctor. Her mother did support her dream. Her fate was settled by a coin toss. The coin showed heads, and Yuan Yuan started her dancing career. Now, many say the pandemic is a chance for people to take it slow and reflect on a lot of things such as career, dreams, and life in general. So what's been going through the artist's mind? Let's hear what Yuan Yuan has to say. Yuan Yuan, uh, tell yeah. me more about that, your career. I mean, you started, you, your mother actually fell in love with ballet, but she didn't manage to because your grandpa didn't want her to be. Uh, but you actually fulfilled her dream in a way, right? Yes, that's uh, actually my mom's decision to just put me to the ballet school. How does it translate from a dream of your mom into a dream of yours and also implement that dream? Probably that is the key. Oh, uh, well, I just uh, have uh, my mom's always cheer me up on and uh, she is the one to help me go through the difficult times. Yes. When I'm when I'm not a good student because I was 
a year later than the other mm -hmm. student. So I was very depressed and I was very become very quiet and always crying. But my mom that time she was always there for me. Mm -hmm. And if I have uh, you know questions and I have like hard times and she's the one I you know go back to talk to and, and cry with. So yeah, um, she was always there on this career road. She was always there for me. Now you know at the time of the pandemic, it gives us a lot of time and probably quite a moment to reflect upon a lot of things. So particularly this is your 25th anniversary of professional career. Um, uh, what went through your mind? What had been going through your mind, Yuan Yuan? So uh, I, I felt just like it's just like yesterday. Uh, I just landed in San Francisco and joined this company. Uh, but in the way I have a lot of experience with all the people I worked with and all the dancers I uh, danced with, um, it, it, I just felt very lucky and I've been through all that and see the company, um, you know, going through things and then become uh, one of the world famous ballet company and then I become the, the crown jewel of the company. Mm -hmm. So I have to say, I think I really work very hard to get where I am yeah. and I always, uh, no matter what happens, and it's uh, Bali come first. Bali um, come first, and still. this 25, yeah, still is. And then uh, that I see the beauty of it and then, you know, with, hmm. I will not be Tan Yuan Yuan without Bali. In the future, I would like to have something in return to mm -hmm. my country for some educational mm -hmm. things I can do, creative things I can do, and it's all like, um, it would be like all this experience is the soil yes. for the tree to grow and blossom. You know, there are a lot of young dancers Yuan Yuan, in the world. All of them want to have a chance. And of course, uh, they want to be where you are. Um, but on the other hand, it's not just about energy, it's not just about vigor or technique. It takes a lot of different qualities to be the crown jewel mm -hmm. of a dance company. Yeah, I think because, that, because I'm Chinese and I have uh, naturally very shy like uh, ingredients in me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think of like the fineness and the sen like very sensitive feelings that that apply to the very just like a rough you know uh, just open arms but I can do showing a, a more of fem feminine style in it so mm -hmm. and also that I get into if there's a story ballet I get into my character very deeply mm -hmm. so I think that for me for all these years dance experience that I can really like feel it and I can feel the music within and within the movement mm -hmm. and just uh, to deliver from inside out. Mm -hmm. It's not only, you know, how many curves, how many turns you can do, how high you jump and how many tricks you can do. Yes, it's wow, bravo. But something like it's, it's a human being. Yes. And when you touch yourself first, you have to be touched yourself and then you can also influence the audience and they will be touched. But on the other hand, with this pandemic, this round, unlikely, according to most of the virologists and epidemiologists we've been talking to, likely to be another wave, unfortunately, during the winter time. Um, so how yeah. will performance arts become, you know? Uh, what will performance arts become? What does that mean for dancers like you to think about, uh, you know, the unpredictability you're likely to face? Yeah, well, uh, that's uh, yeah, a really crucial fact is that uh, we cannot go back to stage anytime soon, for sure. And for the dancers, without training, like uh, extreme training for all these times, for like three, four months, then you need a time to get back to shape. Right. Therefore, you need one or two months at least to get back to shape. You cannot just jump 
jump all over the stage and dance it. No, right. impossible. So uh, that's an issue. And then we are trying to uh, come up with a method how we do it. Like uh, maybe we could do a uh, performance without audience because better not have like so crowded. Mm-hmm. And then we are not not allowed to have been so crowded in the one venue. Mm-hmm. And maybe we do some kind of you know live stream of the real performance on the stage. Yuan Yuan, my final question. You've been working extremely hard for the cultural exchange between China and the United States. What do you make of the complicated situation now to an artist like you who are keen to bring the best to both audience? What does that mean to you? Well, I think really art have no boundary. That's one thing. And I think right now we are very important because, you know, this is like a relationship between countries and the artists can can help. You know, the music have no boundary, the dance have no boundary, you know, theater, the opera, ballet have no boundary. We all are united. Yes. And I think it's it's very important for us to deliver mm. positive energy to the world. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Uh, we are together to fight this virus. Mm. And therefore, if we're together, it's better than just whether you're alone. The story of Yuan Yuan Tan. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more Search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.